Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, this is, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, this is his only uh, book event in Washington to discuss his newest book, uh, World Order. And uh, it is something, I must say, I finished it at 2 o'clock in the morning, Henry, so I, I, I will be a little foggy, but I hope I can bring out some of the deep, rich texture of this book. And I'm only going to get it started for all of us, and then we're going to collectively engage in a conversation with Dr. Kissinger on this, on this remarkable piece. Uh, he asked me, he said, I don't have to give a speech, do I? And I said, no, I, but we are all going to help him bring out the texture of this book. So let me just begin, Henry, to, with a very simple question. Why did you write it? And who did you write it for? Before I do that, can I make a comment about the question with which you began? Yes, sir. Which is, can you hear me? <laughs> By definition, those who can't hear you can't answer it. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, I, I so why did I write this book? Uh, this, it's, uh, I can answer that precisely. I was having dinner with a friend. And uh, at that time, I was thinking of writing a book about, uh, like, the Churchill book on great contemporaries, about significant individuals and their impact and why. And then uh, my counterpart suggested why not write, what, don't write a book about the past, write a book about the most important current problem that you see. And so we discussed that issue, and we came to the conclusion that the collapse of world order, uh, the, in a way, absence of world order was one of the, dom was the, maybe the dominant problem of our period. And so I started writing a book about it. It took about uh, nearly three years. So this was not a book that was geared to the contemporary situation. This was a book that evolved in a situation in which the problem was apparent, but its manifestations hadn't fully occurred yet. Just so, this is a teaser. I hope everybody's bought one by now, but uh, just as a teaser, uh, Dr. Kissinger goes through a very interesting exposition of the Westphalian system, characterizing it as only one of the, of the order, uh, structures by which you could create an, a world order, looked at how the Islamic world looks at, uh, the, at statecraft, the role of diplomacy, the role of states, looks at the Chinese point of view, which is a, a beautiful little condensation of his book on China, uh, it looks at India, looks at Iran, a few other countries, uh, and then says, what's going to be the ordering principle for the international system going forward? Before I turn to ask you about the punchline, let, I'd like to just dig in on a few things. There's one, one piece here which I thought was fascinating. He was talking about the Westphalian system, and he said, uh, diplomats at Vienna were weeks away from their capitals. It took four days for a message from Vienna to reach Berlin, three weeks for a message to reach Paris. London took a bit longer. Instructions, therefore, had to be drafted in language general enough to cover changes in situations. So the diplomats were instructed primarily on general concepts and long-term interests with respect to day-to-day -day tactics, and they were largely on their own. We live in quite a different world. We live in a world of instant communications. Uh, is it possible to create an international system that doesn't have detachment for diplomats? Uh, let me make one observation about your pre uh, previous point. The f basic argument I make with respect to the Westphalian system is uh, it's twofold. That in the past, order in the world was imperial in nature. It was primarily, and I would, from my limited knowledge, exclusively in the West, that the notion of order 
based on a balance of sovereign states uh, evolved. And that in China, in the Islamic world, it was conceived as a unified system and not as a system that was d divided up. Uh, of course, this is in China after the period of the warring uh, states. Uh, so that that was my it's my basic argument. Now the Westphalian system spread across the world as a result of colonialism, uh, largely as a result of colonialism. So many new countries adopted some of the language of the Westphalian uh, system without internalizing it. And one of the problems of our period is that what we consider order and international law is really a Western invention that is accepted only in part and sometimes not at all in, uh, in other parts of the world. Now to get to your point on diplomacy. Uh, those of us who have practiced diplomacy in the current world know that it is quite feasible and quite frequently done that ambassadors are instructed verbatim as to what they should say at important meetings. And that uh, in any event, even if they're not instructed in so much detail, they are instructed with great precision uh, if it's an important subject, and not necessarily, and I would say very rarely, given the conceptual background of what the overall strategy of the leadership is. In the period about, with, in the period in the 18th, 19th century, when distances were so great, the instructions had to be conceptual. And if you wanted to change the policy of your government, there was no point arguing about a specific instruction, but you had to make a conceptual argument of why the government should change the major directions of its policy. So as a result, inevitably, in the modern system, the diplomatic, the internal diplomatic dialogue is very pragmatic and very short term. While in that period, when say Castlereagh communicated with London, he had to explain his philosophy. And it was true of the others. Uh, that was not true of Metternich, who was in his capital. But even the Prussians were uh, more than a week Away. So it's a general proposition, and about a later period that I wrote, not in this book in great detail, uh, when Bismarck, Bismarck started his diplomatic career as ambassador of Prussia to the German Confederation. And he violently disagreed with the traditional thinking of Prussian foreign policy which was uh, close cooperation uh, with Austria and based on, and then European legitimacy. He challenged all of this on the basis of national interest. And he wrote long, hundred, I mean, he collected there was many volumes of dispatches in which he explained the theory on which he thought foreign policy should be conducted. You wouldn't, this wouldn't be possible today. I wouldn't know outside of Kennan. Uh, and, and, but he was really some distance away and both conceptually and it's very rare that uh, diplomatic, even internal diplomatic exchanges reach that level. 
Hey, Henry, when you, when you discuss uh, the Westphalian system, you talk about the radical shock that the French Revolution had on it, that all of a sudden it introduced rather universalistic popular sentiments that made it harder to do diplomacy. Do you want to just recount that for, for the audience here today? And I have a follow-up question. John has read the book more recently than I have. <laughs> <laughs> if you need any and help, let me know. So let me <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> of course, the Westphalian peace emerged at the end of the Thirty Years' War, which had, fund, had two bases. One was the religious basis, and the other one was the attempt by France to bend the religious war into a geopolitical enterprise. And in that, they fundamentally succeeded because they it produced an outcome which kept Central Europe divided, uh, France strong, France a Catholic country whose ruler had the title of the most Catholic majesty, uh, France allied with Protestant Sweden in a war against Catholic Austria. So that uh, war then ended, however, with a decision that the religious conviction of, of uh, populations should be left to the decision of their rulers. And that, therefore, th they had no right, no outside country had a right to intervene in that decision. So that wars in that concept were fought for geopolitical reasons and for the uh, uh, for the balance of power, and so I'd say that the two major elements of the, of the uh, uh, Westphalian system were uh, non-intervention uh, uh, and a, a balance of power. Uh, non-intervention in domestic affairs, and an equilibrium uh, of, uh, of powers. Uh, this, uh, however, presupposes that no country uses its domestic institutions to subvert the domestic institutions of another country. Because if you make the prevalence of your domestic institutions the key to international peace, then you are also obliged to undertake a crusade to achieve it. Uh, and the French Revolution with many, of course, many aspects, but uh, they were an example of this tendency of making conversion the element of foreign policy was a declaration signed by the National Assembly which any country could fill in, uh, saying that France would support the revolutionary elements or the republican elements in, uh, in any of the society and putting French power at the disposal. So then the, this meant a breakdown of the basic concepts of the uh, Westphalian system. Another aspect of the Westphalian system was what was new at that time. It was uh, the emergence of the concept of the state as a legal entity. That, in, that government no longer was the expression of royal power, but royal power symbolized the uh, existence uh, of, of a uh, state which conducted essentially geopolitical policy. And the founder of this was Cardinal Richelieu, a cardinal who was, uh, 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 who was 
uh, whatever his title was, he was in charge of foreign policy of France. Uh, yeah, but he said uh, uh, the individualist model he will be fulfilled in the hereafter, but the state will be judged by uh, its current by its current actions. So that therefore th there were no universal principles above the geopolitical necessities of the state. And this is what gradually became the dominant principle after the Treaty of Westphalia of European diplomacy and I think of many respects global diplomacy. But it means that if the uh, convictions of a group, of a governing group, go beyond the borders of the state, then either the state breaks down, which is what we're seeing in the Middle East, or the state holding such views will be engaged in a de facto crusade. You, you, you talk about how the French Revolution and then the Bolshevik Revolution up, upended the Westphalian system in the sense that it brought uh, popular energy connected with rather universalistic objectives. And in a sense, that seems to be a problem we have in the United States with a sustained foreign policy. Partly running through your narrative is a critique of America's missionary impulse. Uh, well, uh the American missionary impulse, as long as we were separated from the rest of the world, had a profound historic foundation that this was a country that was populated by people who had turned their back on the societies in which they lived. And they were convinced, uh, and rightly so, that in the new country they would find a possibility to express views that had been proscribed at home. And, uh, and so the idea of America as an example to the world uh, was sort of a natural expression of not the 19th century experience, uh, because we fundamentally asked nothing of the rest of the world except not to intervene uh, in our affairs. It became a challenge to American foreign policy when we attempted to imply, uh, apply these, uh, these principles uh, not just as values, but as implementing principles of a, of a balance of power and of a ge geopolitical system. And in that sense, uh, much of American foreign policy, or some of, but some of American foreign policy, can be described as an oscillation between uh, periods of withdrawal or periods of maybe overcommitment, and where the I, where uh, the pragmatic nature of America, the American experience in which every problem that had been recognized as a problem had proved soluble in some manner. When applied to diplomacy, it means that for every problem, we have a temptation to offer a solution. Uh, and that, that solution is conceived as being implementable in a limited period of time. And this gives a uh, on the one hand, an impetus, but also a universalism to American foreign policy, which is not always reconcilable, A, with its lower pace of history, or sometimes with the necessities of the situation. You, you say you wrote it over a three-year period, but you talk about ISIS in the book. And in one sense, I'm, I'm to pick up on this question you have about oscillations between engagement and withdrawal. It seems to me we're kind of caught here, at a, these two in a phase shift. Are we, 
uh, you know, the, the, the president clearly doesn't want to get involved, uh, and yet the international system seems to require that somebody lead to be involved to solve it. Do you have a, an insight? For Actually, I, I have to confess, the, the few sentences uh, were stuck in in going through the proofs, <laughs> and it was probably a mistake uh, because uh, I had made the same point as a general forecast of what was going to happen with less precision. Uh, because uh, I consider ISIS sort of an almost inevitable outcome of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the evolution of an upheaval that has a whole set of different components. It has an upheaval against constituted authority. It's an upheaval caused by the uh, split between the Shia and Sunni religions or sects or aspects of the Muslim religion going on for a thousand years. And it's a revolution against an artificial state system that was imposed in the uh, Middle East at the end of the 19, uh, around 1920, in the, right after the Second World, the First World War. And it was really a reflection of a line of demarcation between French and British imperial interests. The, there was no such thing as an Iraq before 1920. There was no such thing as a Syria in its present uh, dimension. So that the civil war, that it's therefore very difficult to speak of a national feeling in the sense that we know it, uh, that we know it in the West. And uh, this set of upheavals has in, uh, in ISIS, but Al-Qaeda existed before that. And what ISIS represents is the combination of a terrorist trend with geographic control of territory. But let me, but let me just um, press, and I'll, I'll probably ask an awkward question here, but is, is, given our system and America's role in it, in it, is it possible for an international system to work when the leading country wants to lead from behind? Not awkward for me. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, You know, much of, it, of discussions in circles like I represented here uh, seems to state it as a requirement that America must lead. And that is then defined that America must come up with a solution that everybody uh, must follow. I, I don't think that is so much the essential requirement. The essential requirement is that the United States properly understands the nature of, of uh, the evolution through which it is going. That it then, for its own thinking, as I point out, it needs to understand how it is affected and how it can influence these events and distinguish between matters that America must do alone, if necessary matters which it should do only with allies, and matters it shouldn't do at all. And if it thinks clearly enough about these three issues, then the United States, by its weight uh, and by its convictions, will have a significant influence. Uh, I thought the uh, excursion, or whatever you call it, into Libya, was based on an inadequate analysis 
Uh, and if we are involved militarily, uh, we should learn one lesson, one absolutely key lesson, simply because I've lived through it, it means particularly much, but I see others here, like General Scowcroft, who have also lived through it, which is this. Since World War II, we have fought five wars. We brought only one of them to the conclusion that we stated as its objective at the beginning. The other one was sort of a draw, and three others we withdrew from uh, in one form or another. That cannot be a continued pattern of American foreign policy because it demoralizes uh, the uh, public and it makes it impossible then uh, to have a unified uh, uh, policy. Uh, so that is the uh, uh, overwhelming concern. Uh, yes, we should do what our best role is in bringing about objectives within the framework that I have described. But whether we, uh, the abstract leadership idea is not one that I spend sleepless nights over. You, when you started off your response, you said something which I think was uh, in, uh, very telling. No, I'm going to let the audience start. No, no, talking. I'm fine. Uh, but just to, uh, you said, if it thinks clearly, but how does a democracy think clearly, uh, especially one that's so fractured with our domestic politics the way it is now? I don't have an answer to this question, because when democracy evolved, it was in essentially middle class societies, and the debates were dominated. Uh, the issues were relatively few, and had an essentially philosophical basis. They were big issues. Uh, and the, uh, while the public had an opportunity to express itself at periodic intervals, the leaders were not driven by the need to justify themselves day after day in the face of a constant uh, ex exhibition of every uh, pressure group that might have a bearing on, uh, on uh, the discussion. So therefore, in almost every country in that period, uh, you developed some leaders, uh, and over an extended period of time, that had its conceptual quality. If you look at Britain, that in one century produced uh, Catherine, Palmerston, uh, Disraeli, Gladstone, and Salisbury, uh, and all of them men with, uh, with vision and not just uh, tactical uh, people. So if you, but in, in our present period, when you think of the presidential campaigns that are now starting, the candidates by necessity have to uh, be preoccupied with how they can present themselves in state after state, and to present themselves in terms of the various pressure groups that can be originated. So you can take it for granted that in the three, four years before they become president, they have not been able to think consistently about geopolitical problems. That is no fault of theirs. So then you get into office, with some of the mindset that developed during the campaign. And it becomes very hard to establish a coherent uh, uh, picture. Se secondly, the composition of our Congress has changed in a, f in a fundamental way. Uh, when, when I was in office here, I thought life was tough. And I did not find relations with the Congress necessarily enjoyable, so I don't want to give you uh, the wrong impression. But they were uh, 
people who, by the nature of the system, had been in office for a very long period of time, and to whom you could appeal on the basis of the national interest, and who would not answer you with their local problems, and who were not running for president either, so they didn't have to. So that established a certain floor under the uh, 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 nature of, uh, of, the, uh, of the debate. And now with, in, in the uh, House of Representatives, I don't know how many, there are very few, how many seats are contested, less than 100. Oh yes, probably, probably 30. Yeah, so, uh, so the candidates that are running are not worried about the general issues, they're worried about the extremes in their party that might challenge them in a primary. So uh, this is inherent, and the, I think the fundamental problem of democracy at the moment is how you can develop a general concept when the news cycle is 24, uh, 24 hours and when the fear of offending somebody becomes such a dominant element that less and less are democratic leaders, I would say that's even more true in Europe than here, uh, prepared to ask sacrifices of their people. But it's very hard to be a great country if you're not willing to give up some of the present for the future. One last question that I'm going to open up. Do we have uh, microphones ready to move around? I just want to make sure that we're ready for that. But let me just ask one question, Henry. And that's you, you, uh, you, toward the end of the book, you, you talk about the, the problem of reconciling global economics and global politics. And in essence, I mean, this is my simple-minded characterization, but uh, global economics is horizontal and governments are vertical. You know, we, we don't have this transcending capacity to deal with arch overarching problems. What would you suggest we do about this? Well, I smile because there are people in this room who work technically under me as economists and who expressed their view, their view was once expressed by Secretary Simon who said he thought my knowledge of economics was an argument against universal suffrage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I understand the, the particular problem I'm talking about, I was talking about in the book. My basic argument is this. Economics, it's, it's the dominant economic theory is globalization, which in effect asserts that the divisions between states are superseded by the inherent dynamics of the economic system, and that a expanding economic system and a productive economic system would not treat countries on the basis of their political conviction, but on the necessities of the economic system and on the, uh, how the mechanism uh, of that works. On the other hand, the states are operating on the basis of uh, the economic system, of political systems to which you alluded in your previous questions, since crises are inseparable from the unequal development that will always take place to some extent in the economic world, the solution of these crises will be done on a political basis. And secondly, we have seen in our time that the use of sanctions 
that is a deliberate interruption of the global system becomes a weapon of, uh, of diplomacy. To the extent that that occurs, countries that might be threatened by similar measures have, an in, have, a, have a temptation and an incentive to immunize themselves against such dangers so that on the one hand, the actions of the political system have a tendency towards mercantilism and the necessities of the economic system have a tendency towards globalization. And that's one of the issues we have not resolved. I did not write this book to pretend, as I do in private conversation, that I have a solution to every problem. <laughs> uh, I uh, wanted to say, here is a set of problems which we don't deal with uh, conceptually and practically, and they may be the deepest problems we have. That was the basic purpose of the book. Sometimes I have, I think I have a direction in which to go, but that's not the key reason for writing this. But I thought it may have suggested uh, a slightly different direction for your book, which is given that there is this compelling international economic imperative to find solutions, that that might be a better starting point for a global order than a political system, given that we're all yeah, the political systems. In principle, system. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, how do you apply it to the rise of nations, to the decline of nations, and to the eruption of upheavals? And uh, I think we should preserve the global economic system. To anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you need to devote CSIS to the question. It's a you big question. Me. We'll think about that. Let me, we're going to open up for some questions. Rebecca, I'm going to first pick on Tom Pritzker, who's right down here in the front, to get things started and look forward to people asking questions. So you spoke to this a little bit. Um, could you just look at our system and the Chinese system? The world's changed dramatically since the founding of both of those systems. Are there fundamental faulty major premises in either or both of the systems, or what do you worry about that is sort of a faulty major premise that each system is going to have to navigate around? I didn't quite get the question. He, he, uh, he was suggesting that both we and the Chinese have, have faulty underlying conditions which are affecting our capacity to do diplomacy with each other. How should we think about that? I think that's partially, uh, I think that's partially true. Uh, I, uh, the historic Chinese conception of the universe uh, and until the fairly recent past was different from, quite different from, uh, uh, from uh, the Westphalian system. But the immediate problem in Sino-American relations is the one that has often been discussed, that when a successful country that uh, appreciates the status quo, it's facing a rising country. And how to integrate the rising country uh, into an international system without, conflict, without war. Uh, I think that is the dominant uh, uh, Sino-American problem of, uh, of our period. And uh, So, I mean, some expressions of it are that we have great belief in arbitration. Uh, the Chinese consider that the agreement to arbitration, before you have an agreement on principle, 
it's an abdication of their position to begin with. So, but be that as it may, I, I, I think the fundamental period, problem of a period is this. And there the lessons of World War I seem to me to be overwhelming. Uh, if you look at the issues that produced World War I, uh, they went through a decade, at least a decade, of, of constant mutual irritation on essentially peripheral problems, peripheral to the central survival of their, their society. And uh, most of those issues had been resolved. Uh, and suddenly one issue came along that wasn't solved. Even though as an issue it was perhaps less significant than some of those they had solved in the Balkan Wars and in the Moroccan crisis. Uh, and at the end of that process, they sort of slid into war. They didn't know how to end it. And at the end of it, uh, the structure of European order was irretrievably destroyed. Now, any of us can list a catalog of disagreements that exist between us and, uh, and China. And we have, on the whole, managed to deal with them on both sides. And both of the leaders have asserted uh, that they want to create a relationship that transcends that of traditional adversaries. Uh, in my view, with apologies to the distinguished ambassador from China, we have not, on either side, fully lived up to, to this objective. We have been skillful in solving short-term problems. We have not yet come up with something that shows to the world that we are trying to move into a new uh, pattern. And it, it's so easy uh, to, to find that. But there are so many crises going on in which I hope we will, in the next few years, uh, we're starting with the president's trip to China, uh, find a way to lift the issues to that level. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Akbar Faja, former World Bank official, with a note of thanks to CSIS and also uh, to Mr. Kassinger. My question yeah, is maybe. focused on... Talk a little louder, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm Akbar Khwaja, former World Bank official. My question is focused on uh, if you could kindly comment on President Obama's policies uh, towards South Asia, particularly to Pakistan and India, and if you could add a comment on civil nuclear technology assistance to India, but not to Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, he wants you to offer your insights into India and Pakistan uh, from an American point of view, and then if you have thoughts, care to share them about uh, the civil military cooperation specifically, the things we will do with India we will not do with Pakistan. Well, I'm not going into the second part of the question because I don't know exactly uh, uh, what, what we're doing. Uh, the India-Pakistan uh, crisis, obviously, is a result of the uh, period of decolonization in which uh, the British uh, divided the region into the the predominantly Hindu region and those who did not want to live in an in Hindu dominated region, which were mostly Muslims. Uh, but it was very difficult to draw this dividing line in such a way that the objective was achieved and then the populations have increased so much uh, that 
the Muslim population, which in India was a small, relatively smaller minority, has uh, in, it is largely, uh, considerably. On the uh, Pakistan side, its existence depended on it. It's different from India and from the latent fear that India might want to reverse that experience. And there was the additional problem of Kashmir. Uh, and uh, so for, for, for the whole period, there have been, I don't know, four, at least four wars between India and Pakistan. Uh, theoretically, uh, at least from the American point of view, we have no interest in the conflict between India and Pakistan as we, it, it may, in, it is not to us a balance of power problem. And all American policymakers that I've ever known would welcome a, uh, Solution through this con to this conflict in some manner uh, through negotiation, but now both countries have nuclear weapons, and a conflict with them between them could have uh, uh, the profoundest uh, global consequences. Uh, the United States in recent years has been. Uh, substantially cooperative with with India. And it's another one of those issues. It is often described as a strategic problem, uh, alliance. I think the defense of India is largely an Indian responsibility. But placing India into a South Asian context in which we can cooperate. That is a very important task. And uh, now the difference between civilian military relationship, I don't know what you're referring to, uh, uh, particularly in, uh, uh, so. It's, it's outside really of the conversation right here. So right. let me move, I just want to, I've got two questions right here and, and let's move the microphone, Chelsea, right in. But let me just say, if you got a cell phone, you please turn it to silent, silent stun, you know, you'll feel better, we'll feel better, okay. Yeah, right, either one of those two gents right there and then we'll, you'll get it next, you'll get it next. My name is uh, <clears throat> Amitav Acharya, I'm a professor at uh, American University. Uh, my question is about China. Do you think China is a revisionist power? Uh, does China want to live within the current international order, which is uh, substantially still the American-led liberal order? Or what, does China want to create its own world order, where it wants America to, I mean, others to live in? He, so the question is, is, is China willing to live within a Westphalian system, a system it didn't design but is having to operate today, or does it want to create its own international system? The Chinese ambassador is here is in a better position to answer that than I am. We'll give him the microphone uh, later. <laughs> I, I would say this. The Westphalian system does not come naturally to the Chinese mind because the historic position of China has been to regard itself as the Middle Kingdom and the other countries had some degree of tributary relationship uh, to China so that the notion of sovereign equality operating by the largely legal principles is not an original Chinese idea. And therefore, uh, some aspects of the Westphalian system will be instinctively uh, treated by, uh, by Chinese as interference uh, or condescension of some kind. Uh, on the other hand, the basic aspect of the Westphalian system, which is to recognize the state as a 
basic unit of international politics and of sovereign, uh, of, of non-intervention in the domestic affairs of other states uh, is, are compatible with the practice of China in, uh, in its present incarnation. Uh, right next to Chelsea, we would, I'll come down here. Thank you. My name is Paolo von Schirach, uh, Schirach Report. In keeping with uh, the differentiation that you made a moment ago, uh, Dr. Kissinger, regarding the fluctuation in America between overcommitment and withdrawal, there is a relatively recent development now, and that is lack of means. In other words, it seems to me that right now, whatever the inclination may be of, of the nation or policymakers, we are a country with $17 trillion debt, with an economy that is growing at a trend of 2% a year, as opposed to the historic 3% of the post-war period. Our main allies in Europe are about zero growth, with uh, defense uh, budgets ranging from 1% to 2%, four or five of them at the most, uh, reach the NATO goal of 2%. Japan is in what I would call a sort of a terminal demographic decline. Therefore, ourselves and our allies seems to be plagued whatever other issues there are in terms of orientation and agreement on basic uh, policy, uh, we have a, a fundamental fiscal and economic problem. Without means, there is very little, or at least a lot less, that can be done by the United States, whether it leads or it's not leading. You know, do you see this as, a, as an issue, or is this transient, or is this going to be remedied? Thank, Thank you. you. The, uh, I'll just rephrase it. Uh, he's, he's suggesting that you know, nations' capacities internationally uh, reflect their underlying strength, and that America's strength is diminished by its large deficits, its slow growth. Our, we're, our primary partner is Europe. Europe is uh, very static economies. Uh, are, are these, because of that, are we in a position to sustain a system that we created? Uh, I agree that the underlying strength of a nation will affect the uh, influence of its diplomacy. By strength, I don't mean uh, just the military strength of a nation, it's, but its capacity to deal with the rapidly changing uh, situation and its values as well as, as its power. That is certainly true. And one has to expect that if a huge gap develops in the internal capacities of various nations, that their relative influence will decline. Uh, but the solution to that problem is to enhance the elements of of national capacity, uh, uh, and uh, but one cannot simply passively wait and expect that an international system in the abstract will defend one. One has to participate in the international process as a relevant country, and loss of relevance is unforgivable. Uh, uh, Rebecca, right down here in the front, this lady, then I'll come to, to you, uh, Diana. I'm Kumi Yokoe from Hitachi. Um, the high tension is rising between Japan and China. Do you have any advice, uh, leader, Japanese leader and the Chinese leader? Uh, I'm not sure I understood, but you're talking about the tension inside China. Between China, between China and, and, China and Japan. Between China and Japan. There's a tension between China and Japan. And I guess, how do you assess it, and how do you forecast where it may go? Of course, there's a historic basis for it. And of course, the aftermath of the war has created legacies which can fuel uh, this. But ultimately, I believe these tens the outcome of these tensions will depend on 
the evolution of Northeast Asian relationships and of the future of Northeast Asia. But there, there are problems like Korea uh, that will fundamentally affect the relationship between uh, uh, Japan and China, and, and also the continued role of the United States uh, in that region. Uh, I, of course, consider the immediate tensions important. But the deeper issue will be how one visualizes how the, the major countries of Northeast Asia will and should interact with each other over an extended period of time and not merely over the next few months. Uh, we're, we're right back with, it, with your hands up, right, right there. Yep. And then, we, and then Diana, and then I'm going to have to wrap it up with this question. We need to Thank sign you. books. Uh, Joe Bosco, formerly with the Defense Department and a, a, a student of uh, Dr. Kissinger. It's good to see you again. Uh, following up on the China uh, questions, do you believe that, that China has engaged in an active policy of undermining and distracting the United States from its global position, such as by enabling the North Korean nuclear and missile program, proliferating weapons of mass destruction, and supporting some of the world's most odious regimes. Did, uh, he, he's suggesting that China, the, a provocative question, that China is undermining America by supporting North Korea, by uh, supporting obnoxious regimes around the world. Do you have a view on this? Uh, it's a basic principle. I think that China uh, conducts a policy of equilibrium around the world, and therefore they do not consider it their duty to solve all our embarrassments in specific regions. But this particular issue that you mentioned, I have a different perception of the North Korean issue, and I expressed it, in fact, in this book. Uh, I think China feels itself substantially threatened by events in, uh, in North Korea and does not particularly seek, on the contrary, would prefer not to have a nuclear armed country and would be open to a discussion of the evolution of, uh, of Northeast Asia. And whatever you think of Chinese actions in other parts of the world, uh, in, on the issue of North Korea, I'm absolutely convinced. Uh, and I have, I'm absolutely convinced that the analysis I made is a, is, is a, a correct assessment. Now, in other parts of the world, uh, it, it's quite possible, in fact, likely, that our preferred solution is not necessarily accepted by the Chinese, but that doesn't mean that they do it in order to particularly undermine, uh, undermine us. Uh, I think the evolution of our capacity to deal with China depends on us and not on, uh, I do not think that we are now in a global conflict uh, with China, uh, but it might develop and that would be a great tragedy uh, Diana, for both sides. Uh, Diana, and I'm going to have to probably make this the last. Go ahead, Diana. Thank you, Diana Lady Dugan. Um, former government official and CSIS senior advisor. Um, since I am the last dog to be hung, I uh, took the liberty of reading the last paragraph of your book. And many of us have bought it but not had the pleasure to read it. And I was, I was struck 
by the fact that to your, your last line is that uh, the greatest, most consequential issues of the human condition have been, uh, must be faced and that decisions to meet these challenges must be taken by statesmen before it's possible to know what the outcome may be. And since you clearly demonstrate you're a 21st century as well as 20th century uh, statesman, a question becomes, uh, in this era, uh, and every, there's, this, there's a lot of deja vu in every century, but when we do have uh, frequent flyer diplomacy, sound bite uh, decisions, and not just identifying winners and losers, and, but uh, not just rewarding winners and losers, but creating winners and losers. How do you, one, uh, remain optimistic about the, the creation of statesmen uh, like you and others in this room, and how do you think that they can be, will be different in the 21st century? Well, the last uh, paragraph of the book, uh, it's sort of a personal reflection of uh, the difference between my view of history as an undergraduate and after some 70 years of observing uh, the world. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to, to make the point that the it's the upheaval in the world right now. It's unprecedented. Uh, and statesmen are obliged to deal with it. And they cannot step into the same river twice uh, and above all, that they have to act on the basis of assessments. They cannot prove true when they make it. So it depends importantly on the moral strength and the courage of leaders because all the questions you asked and many more, so one could, many more we could elicit really are on the issue, what do we think is likely to happen? Or how can we deal with it? Uh, and this is where statesmen have to make a choice. And where they have to develop a concept. And I confess, I think the contemporary leadership in most parts of the world is not meeting that challenge, at any rate, not fully. Uh, and it's the big unsolved problem of our period. That's really all I meant to say in that last paragraph, which is there's a set of consequential issues of our time. And the statesmen do not know how they will turn out when they undertake them, but they have no choice but to undertake them. That's a fitting benediction for a remarkable afternoon. Would you please join me with your applause in saying thank you to Dr. Henderson. Well, he'll be signing books outside. If you have one and need it signed, please let the good doctor get up there where he can get it right. We have, you'll have to line up to get it, so thank you.